grace and peace to you and welcome to Lexington Presbyterian Church on this Transfiguration of the Lord Sunday. It's indeed a pleasure to have each of you connecting with us this morning, either through Zoom conferencing or, or on our YouTube channel. There are several announcements that need to be made this morning. Join us on Wednesday of this week at 7 p.m. for our Ash Wednesday service. You can pick up the ashes uh, right outside the Brady Chapel uh, door uh, and in the little plastic box that says ashes to go. So please uh, do so before uh, uh, Wednesday night. Also, uh, on Thursday evening, February 25th, and also Thursday, March the 11th, we will have a presentation from the CAT survey. You'll... Um, the CAT survey team has put together a presentation to show you the results of the survey that you guys completed in August of this year. And so you'll see more information for that, but that'll happen on Thursday, February 25th at 7 p.m. Also due to the uh, Virginia Department of Health statistics, uh, we continue to monitor, monitor those uh, numbers and we will not be worshiping in person next Sunday. So. Let us now call ourselves to worship. The Mighty One speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Keep not your silence before us, O God, but let the heavens declare your righteousness. Gather to me, my faithful ones, all you who have made a covenant with me. We offer you our sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving as we call your name. Let us worship God. Let us pray together. Morning by morning, you awaken us, O God. Day by day, you show us your wondrous love. The words of your commandments fall fresh upon our listening ears. We heed your wisdom and are renewed by your word. You surround us with countless acts that tell of your majesty. We're struck by your goodness as we are refreshed in your spirit. Come, dwell among us, and through Christ let us praise you. You're the God we worship and adore. Amen.
we come to our time of confession. The whirlwind pace of our lives becomes so all-consuming that we may forget our origins. Our busyness separates us from knowledge of God's glory in the face of Christ. Let us seek to renew our relationship with God and be restored to wholeness as we ask God's forgiveness. Let us pray. God of glory, the light of your holiness exposes us in our sinfulness. You hear the secret thoughts we hide from each other. You see the wretched lives we dress up in our Sunday best. You know the motives behind our deeds. So often for our own gain, so seldom for your glory. In your grace, forgive us, O God. Help us to know our sins that we might repent of them truly. Lead us into the light of your glory, through mercy and forgiveness in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, we pray, and let us pray in silence. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Amen. Friends, in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. washed in the waters of God's amazing grace. Let us share this good news with others. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. I invite everyone to now unmute and share the peace of Christ with one another. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace with everybody. Peace with everybody. Peace with everybody. Peace with Christ, everybody. Peace with Christ, everybody. Peace with Christ, everybody. Peace with Christ, everybody. Peace Christ, everybody. Peace with 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 Oh, I saw another heart. Okay. Jesus Christ. Oh, there I am. Oh, there you are. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, I know what. That's right. It's over now. There we are. It's over now. It's over now. Oops.
our generosity can make a difference in the lives of people we will never know and in our own lives as well. Let us give from our hearts in thanksgiving for all God has done for us. Let us pray. Use our gifts, O God, to bring light where there is gloom, hope where there is despair, peace where there is turmoil. We dedicate ourselves and our offering to these ends. Amen. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, free our minds from error. Teach our hearts the living words of Jesus and inspire our lips to share the good news. In the name of the blessed Holy Trinity, amen. Our Old Testament reading today is from Psalm chapter 50, verse one through six. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my consecrated ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice and the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Good morning, friends. It is so good to be with you here today. Well, this Sunday in our church calendar is called Transfiguration Sunday. The word transfiguration is a long, strange word. You have probably never heard the word transfiguration before, but if you have, it is probably only on this very Sunday of the year. Well, transfiguration is a very, very very special word. So I would like to teach you a bit about this word. So the cool thing about this word is that if we break it apart, we can all understand it a bit better. Well, I brought some cards today. The word trans means to change. Then the word figure means to shape or to form. Transfigure, like this, trans plus figure equals to change, shape, or form. Transfiguration. We add the ation on at the end because transfigure is the verb, the action. Ation makes it a noun or a thing. There you have it, transfiguration. Okay, did you happen to notice where I am this morning? Yep, I'm outside, out back, sitting in my yard on a bed of snow. And it is rather chilly, so I am bundled up. But I got to thinking, this snow is a really good way to try and show you how transfiguration, this 
this strange word works. Well, if I could, I would lay in the snow and wave my legs up and down. And what do you think will happen if I did that? Yes, I would make a snow angel. And I had planned to do that, but last night, rain came and turned the snow into ice. It is transfigured. Isn't that cool? How about that? Now, if I grab a bunch of snow in my hands from underneath the ice, and I bunch it together and push it, what happens to this snow now? Oh, yes, it transfigured into a snowball. Our snow over the past few days was a beautiful snow. Then it was transformed into this ice covered snowscape. And now I have transformed or transfigured it into a snowball. Isn't that something? It is the same snow, but we're seeing it in a whole different way. And I bet you know, or I bet you snow, so many other things that snow can be transfigured into. I bet you're thinking about a bunch of them right now. Snow cream, snowman, the list is endless. Well, something similar happens in this week's gospel lesson that Pastor Tom will be reading in a few minutes. Several of the disciples are walking with Jesus up, up on a high, high mountain when all of a sudden they see him in a new and different way. His clothes suddenly become dazzling white like this snow and they hear the voice of God explaining that this Jesus is my son. We call this story in the Bible the transfiguration of Jesus. Jesus' appearance changed and he became some, something new to the disciples. Jesus doesn't change his shape, no. But with this comes, with this, but like with this snow turned into something new, suddenly the disciples are able to see him in a new way, a whole new way. And something even more special, the Son of God. It is a very exciting moment that changes everything for them and for us. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for bringing us Jesus. We thank you for the coming of your son here on earth. Help us to be disciples of Jesus. Help us to glow just like the snow in the lives of the people that we come in contact with. All God's people said amen. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter, beginning in the second verse. And Mark recounts, recounts the transfiguration of Jesus upon a high mountain. And this account is nestled with a, within a portion of Mark that paves the way for the crucifixion. Three times in this section, from chapter 8 through 10, uh, Jesus predicts his coming death and resurrection. Despite the dark note that these predictions uh, sound, the account of the transfiguration 
provides a moment of glory in an otherwise increasingly dark story. And so hear now the Word of God beginning in the second verse. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A young man went off to college with great expectations. After he had been in college for one month, he texted his father, feather in my cap, elected class president. Two months later, he sent another text to his father, another feather in my cap, accepted into the best fraternity. A month after that, a third text, still another feather in my cap, leading role in class play. One semester later, he sent this text to his brother, flunked out, prepare father, tell him to send money for me to get home. And the brother replied back, father prepared, prepare yourself. Father says to put those feathers on your shoulders and fly home. So do you ever talk yourself into a similar situation? Sometimes the need to open our mouths and show the world how clever we are confirms just the opposite beyond the shadow of a doubt. Without even seeing it coming, we stick our foot right into our mouth. What perverse drive is it that continually lands us in this awkward, graceless, foolish-looking position? Fear is probably the greatest single cause of human stupidity. We are afraid of others and afraid of ourselves. The young man at college was afraid to tell his father the truth about himself. Afraid to admit that he found the workload heavy, the coursework hard, and the pace daunting. And so he devised his feather communications to project an image of his first experience as co at college as lighthearted and carefree successful and satisfying. Socially, he was a feather, floating on the air of acceptance from one success to the next. Scholastically, he was a stone. And not all the feathers in the world could help him when he sank out of sight academically. Now what might have happened to this young man if he had revealed his well-founded fear of academic failure to his father instead of only communicating about the fluff in his life. He might have discovered that he wasn't the only person to ever have a tough time adjusting to college life. He might have even discovered that his father had similarly struggled. More often than not, we say stupid things when we get our comeuppance. Consider the preacher who thought that he had the perfect uh, illustrative device for his Sunday sermon. Lugging a small basket of new potatoes into the pulpit, he proceeded to pull them out one by one, christening each one with its own particular name character. One potato he named Imitator. Another was Agitator. Still another was called Dictator. And after going through this silly exercise, he then admonished, the, admonished all the groaning congregation and, and said, now I want you all to be sweet taters. As the congregation filed out of the church, one long-suffering parishioner shook the preacher's hand and said, 
I know you want us to be sweet taters, but I am what I am. Now, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> First, we must look at the transfiguration's place in the chronology of Mark's gospel. Mark places it at a crucial moment in the story. Peter has just confessed, you are the Messiah, and received the ear-pinning rebuke from Jesus when he questions the necessity of a suffering, dying, rising Christ. Jesus is repeatedly insistent about the suffering, sacrificial nature of his own life and the lives of those who would follow him. There is little that is glorious or glamorous about the future that Jesus describes here. Fear is what Mark claims prompted Peter's offer to build three little temporary shelters or booths on the mountaintop during the transfiguration event. Elijah and Moses were tremendously powerful, awe-inspiring prophets of God. Good reason for a healthy feeling of fear on Peter's part. Perhaps Jesus' harsh rebuke, get behind me, Satan, still rang in Peter's ears. What if Elijah and Moses knew how Peter had rejected Jesus' words about his death and ultimate resurrection? What if they found him hopelessly disobedient and completely unfit for discipleship? The fear that grips Peter's stomach loosens his tongue and goads him into offering this odd suggestion. Before agonizing over all the theological implications that may lie between these dwellings, consider for a moment what Peter is afraid of. Here's a simple fisherman who's gone, gotten in the middle of an enormously complex theological and political situation. It seems that every time that Peter opens his mouth, he says something wrong. And even when he says something right, when he said, you are the Messiah, he's silenced. And so maybe in the fear that he will once again say something out of line, Peter offers to do something instead, to use his hands, not his head. Unfortunately, like most fear-motivated actions, his plan to avoid saying something stupid backfires, and he once again looks foolish. While fear of ourselves and of others causes a large measure, measure of our foot-and-mouth disease, there's another popular reason that we open up when we should just shut up. Silence. Few things are as unsettling to most of us as standing around in the midst of other people with no one speaking. Silence is something that we accept with grace, only from those that we love the most and trust the best. How many people can you simply sit next to in silence without feeling the weight of the air between you? With whom can you maintain silence when walking on a quiet beach or sitting in the car for a long ride or waiting for the phone call with the lab report or keeping vigil against the soul's dark night or watching the sun come up. If we're lucky, we can keep silence with our spouse. Even luckier still are those that can add a friend or two to that count. Silence is stillness. And keeping still involves taking a risk. When we're talking, we're moving. We're hard to grasp and hard to hold. We can still escape. But sitting in silence takes trust. It takes faith. It takes risking an openness that reveals our true self. This is what God wants. This is why the divine yearns for men and women to be still and know that I am God. In a way, Peter does succeed in avoiding another theological landmine by chattering on about the proposed construction project. At least this time, when he's reprimanded, it's not for saying something wrong. When last he misspoke, Jesus likened Peter to Satan. 
This time, the voice from the divinely sent cloud reveals no reference at all to the content of Peter's suggestion. In fact, the voice is far more reassuring than it is judgmental. Instead of lambasting Peter for his silly suggestion, the voice only asks that Peter stay quiet, that he listen to the beloved son. The voice and vision immediately fade. Only Jesus and his disciples remain. Although the voice did not specify the message that the beloved son had to offer. Jesus' first words to Peter, James, and John when the, when, the visionary, uh, when the vision ends are cautionary. They are to tell no one about what they had seen. A warning that suggests the disciples might themselves be in danger if they spoke outright. And this silence is to be lifted only after the Son of Man had been risen from the dead. As headstrong as the disciples may have been, they could not miss the inference in these instructions that Jesus is going to die. The transfiguration is a mountaintop moment. But it's sandwiched in between two of Jesus' most straightforward revelations about his approaching suffering and death. And finally, there is control. The third way that we end up with our foot in our mouth is trying to take control of a situation and have the last word. Of course, the more we long to take control, the more that we realize just how dependent on others that we are. There's a story of a certain preacher at a time when he was scheduled to speak in Philadelphia. Unfamiliar with the city, the preacher nevertheless decided to walk from the hotel to City Hall and got hopelessly lost. He saw some young people on the street talking and he asked uh, them to direct him to his destination. And one of the young boys asked him, what are you going to do there? And the preacher replied, well, I'm going to give a lecture. About what? On how to get to heaven. Would you like to come along with me? Are you kidding, said the young boy. You don't even know how to get to town hall. Peter's ill-considered attempt to take control of the mountaintop moment of transfiguration also led him far astray from his intended goal. Instead of getting, getting his building project underway, Peter found himself under the cover of God's protective cloud. Instead of taking up a tidy little construction task, Peter found himself taking on the enormous gift of lifelong discipleship. Only a joyless, heartless, relentless round of existence comes from always being the one in control, relinquishing the reins of our lives to God, playing out our lives as genuine disciples of the transfigured Jesus, the transforming Christ, is the only way that we will experience the glory of the living Lord. The reason mountaintop experiences stand out so dramatically is that those are exactly the moments when we are at least in control, or least in control, and most in God. Will you let go of fear, of words, of control, that you might become transfigured in the likeness and image of God? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer, let us turn to God. O God of the mountain, inspire us today with the vision of your splendor on the mountaintop of transfiguration. Just as you transformed Jesus before Moses and Elijah, let us see the dazzling truth of Jesus as did Peter and James and John. Because Christ is your beloved Son, May he be for us a guiding light that illumines our path of discipleship. Create moments in each of our days where we behold his glory for ourselves. Create also in us, O oh God, a passion for ministry to our world, which is so needy. May we be vessels of both divine encouragement and godly truth. O oh Lord, too many of our Brothers and sisters live in the shadows that the world casts upon them. Let us be part of your light that shines to give hope and a good word to those in need. And finally, O oh God, stir us to hear anew the words of life you offer to all people. We ask this in all our prayers in the name of Jesus who taught us all to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Go forth from this place in peace to love and serve the Lord, always rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forever. Amen.